He was known as the dominator throughout his 12-year career at Carlton and with good reason. He was a star in all of the big games, particularly grand finals and games against Collingwood. Welcome, Dom. Mike, how are you? It's been the eventful life from the cradle for you, hasn't it? You were adopted out from birth? Yes. Did you find your natural parents? Yes, I adopted out at 14 weeks. Um, in the sense, did we find uh, my natural parents? Uh, we, my ex-wife, uh, Deb, uh, she was able to contact uh, my birth parents via the Freedom of Information. Obviously, that was done through uh, letters. Uh, we received a letter back, yeah, which was obviously conveying all, all the messages that we thought. But once you get to that stage where it's, they say, no, there's no more communication, that's where it sort of stays. Uh, my mother's name was Geraldine Kelly. My name was Jonathan Michael Kelly, mm. for all extensive purposes. My father was uh, never found. He was a transient European. And we have traced back the, through the history books. And in, 50, in the 50s, late 50s, there were Italian and Yugoslavian immigrants. And I think a couple of my mates say today, say, John, if we have a look back at some of those old photos, yeah, you do look a bit Yugoslavish. They told you at nine that you were adopted. Do you remember how you coped? Um, I didn't really know what it meant. I think that would be the point. I didn't know what it meant. And I just went, oh, well, I'm, I'm adopted. And it took a long time, mm. I think, for that to sink in. Maybe even until my teens, even later. Even later. Well, it wasn't a big deal. These were my parents. Yeah. These are the people that I loved and these are the people that were were looking after me. Now, when, what age were you when you met your natural mother and how emotional was I that? I didn't meet her. You no, never met no, her? No, no, we weren't allowed to meet. We were able to have contact. Uh, Is that by letter? It was by letter, yes, uh, through, via the Freedom of Information. Or the, I think it was by the Freedom of Information. They passed that on. We received a letter back. Uh, that communication suggested that there was never going to be a meeting. and that Was, was that her that call? Was that, that was her call. That was her past. That was wow. her past and that was to stay in the past. Did that hurt? Um... I could understand. I could understand why. And um, it, did it hurt? Um, I was very happy with my parents that I have. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's hard. It's um, hard to understand. Would it have been nice to have met? Obviously it was. So you never met your natural mother? Never mother. met her, no. Now you're footy. You grew up barracking for Geelong. Yes. You uh, played in the VFA 68 games with Paran. Yes. You were rejected twice by Carlton. Yes. Tried to get to Melbourne. And Alex Jesselenko said he wanted one last look at you, correct? Yes, yes. So the year's 1979? Yeah, yeah the pre-season of 78 going into 79, yes. Yeah. Now, amazing story. Your, your whole career's been amazing. But you played in the VFA Premiership team of 1960, 1978. Yes. And you played in the VFL Premiership team of 1979 in front of 112,000 people. Correct, yes. And some would say you should have won the Norm Smith that year. Carlton beat Collingwood. Wayne Harms wins the medal. Yes. Uh, Carlton named you their best player. Yes, they did at our, at our post-match function, but I think that was the first year of the Norm Smith, and I don't think anybody gave a rat's about the Norm Smith. <laughs> we, uh, look, and we, we were simply the best team in the competition that year by a fair way. So, to, uh, yeah, I mean, you look back now, people say maybe I should have won the Norm Smith, but you, you can't take away what harms he did. No. Uh, his one act probably won us. Well, that one act we're talking about was when Wayne Harms has gone to the boundary line, sprinted yes. after the ball that he kicked, Smacked it back into play to yes. Kenny Sheldon in the goal square. Yes. Are you the only person at the ground that day who didn't believe the ball was out of bounds? Oh, I was never out of bounds in my book. <laughs> Has Harmsy ever said anything to you about what he thought, where he thought the ball was at the time? I think sometimes Harmsy in, in the media has gone, it was out just to really peeve the, the, <laughs> the magpie supporters. I'd probably say that too, <laughs> but uh, I think it was, I was just happy enough to win the game, to be honest. Four premierships for you in nine years. How many Norm Smiths should you have won, Wayne? <laughs> well, if you ask my mates on a Friday night, and probably at some stage they've all got Foxtel, they'll watch this, and they'll never stop. And they call me Norm at about midnight on a Friday <laughs> for having a beer, so I started to get the irrits a little bit. Um, oh, look, I suppose, look, I was, I think, 79, 82 and 87, I did win our Best Player Award at a club function. 82, Jono, it was, it was unusual in the fact that Morris Rioli, who won the medal, played in the losing team. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Morris's first half was outstanding. Um, kicked three goals early. I was lucky enough actually to uh, snag the first one and probably make the second one happen, I mm -hmm. suppose, with the tackle. Uh, Rangey was chopping us up in the middle. I think, I think maybe even Harmsy might have been on him. I'm not too sure he was on him. So they moved me on to Jeff just to shut him down for a while, and which I was fortunate enough to do. Then I think Jeff went somewhere else, and now I got Rioli for a little while just before half time. If you watch the tape, I tackled Morris as he was heading towards the uh, members' wing and uh, he hurt himself and went off for a while. Well, I have watched that tape. 
Mm. You tackled someone else that day too, didn't you? Helen D'Amico. Oh, Helen D'Amico, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still dirty about missing that Toyota ad, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I duly got the ad. <laughs> now, we're talking about the woman who ran onto the ground in the third quarter of a grand yes. final. Yes. What was your first... When did you first become aware that there was an intruder? Warren Jones had gone into the ruck and we were really on a roll. And... Uh, Warren was playing the best game of his life. For this lady to run on the ground, go straight to Bruce, and then Bruce, Bruce Dool, and then yeah. Bruce ran into the middle. And obviously to go near Wow Warren Jones at the time, it wasn't going to help his his mental state. I don't think it was a real <laughs> hindrance. And for some reason, I don't know why. I, I, she had a Carlton scarf around the neck, and I was getting a bit peeved with it all. You know, I swear on the show, are you? So I won't. Just gently. Just so I just sort of grabbed her. You scarf, told her to exit the field. And told her, could you get off as quickly as you can? And uh, off she went. And uh, I can tell you now, she wasn't a natural blonde. But all <laughs> Not you true. too. I've heard that joke a hundred times. Yeah, well, now. this was a fact, though, because it was right there in front of me. So you played at 5'9", and, and what weight? Oh, about, I suppose about yeah, 80, 81, 82, okay. something like that. And played a very physical brand of footy, didn't you? Yeah, I tried to. I had to, I think. In the end. Why, why did you have to? I mean, well, I'd, I'd lost... I'd, I used to be a very good overhead mark. I still was a good overhead mark throughout my career, but... In 79 at Carlton, I took a lot of marks, a lot of overhead marks, a lot of pack marks, one-on-one -on -one marks. But then um, the pre-season of 80, I actually did my knee, my right knee, mm -hmm. and then I did it again before the season started, and it really stopped that jumping. And so it helped, it helped actually develop a, a better skills and my below-the-knee stuff. You seem to relish that moment that the ball was in your hands and if a goal needed to be kicked, you wanted to do it? It was, it, was, it was nice. Kicking goals was great. It was. Um, then after a while, I suppose, what, I think in 81, I kicked 50, 50 odd goals. Mm -hmm. 80, sorry, 1980. And then I, I got injured. And then when Parkin came to the club, it was more team orientated, so to speak. So it was good that after a while, I was there for a couple of years, I was able to pinch it into the midfield, and I quite liked the midfield. I actually enjoyed being in the midfield more than kicking goals. Mm -hmm. But then again, I enjoyed kicking goals from the midfield. It was even better than, <laughs> better than anything. Did. You talked about David Park, and David Parkin arrives at Carlton in 1981. Yes. Replaces your mate Peter Jones. Yes. Before the season starts, you're out of the nightclub. Yes. It's three in the morning. Yes. You decide that you don't like the fact that the new coach has cleared your mate Michael Young to Melbourne. Yes. You ring him up. Yes. What possessed you? <laughs> just, it was the alcohol, yeah. was it? Well, it was, um, I was a bit upset for Young, of course. I'd only just found out that he'd uh, been given the flick and... Uh, I was injured, as you know, I was in plaster. <laughs> I was in plaster, you know, I'm at a nightclub. I was going out with a girl from the nightclub at the time, actually, and uh, I uh, just, they gave me the phone. <laughs> and they gave, it was the, 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 the underground phone. And the, un rang, the underground nightclub, It's yep. their phone, and I, uh, I rang Pargo from there and sort of just said, I just didn't, I, I didn't carry on. I just, just said, I totally disagree with what you did with Mark Young. I'm pretty pissed off and uh, don't like the way he was treated. I said, uh, you should have got rid of a few of us if that was the case. Can you imagine a kid doing that now? You're a second year player, you ring the new coach in the middle of the night and abuse him for clearing one of your mates. Yeah, well it showed some passion I suppose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shows what alcohol does. And I was, I was a little bit overweight at the time too, so don't worry, it took, it took a bit of pegging that that one back, Parker, but I think Parker and I have had a great relationship. You did, because you were very good friend too. Back 12 months, after one year, it's the final series of 1980. Perth yes. Jones is the coach. Yes. You finish second on the home and away ladder, I think. Lose your first final. Yes. And you're playing Collingwood. Yes. In an elimination match. Yes. On the Tuesday of that week, you're one of three players. Yes. Out on the tiles until sunrise. Uh, yeah, not quite. You know, they also got the. We went to a barbecue at a at a at the runners' place. It was a club barbecue, and believe it or not, everyone was there. We stayed there for a while, and then went to a party in Sandringham. Funny stories there, but they, they, can, they, they can live to fight another day. We, we obviously slept there for a while, woke up the next morning and uh, started hitchhiking down the, uh, down the beach road. And You talk about being stiff. Uh, Jim Main picked us up from the, the, footy from the inside football and dropped us off at uh, Princess Park. It's even better because we had a key. So we opened up the doors and went and had a shower. You, you were rock stars, you blokes, weren't you, the Carlton boys? I think people thought that. Um, I no, I think you blokes thought that. I think... Uh, I think we thought we were fairly good. You, McClure, Buckley, Youngie, those yeah. guys. I mean, yeah. you lived life hard, didn't you? It's hard. I don't know. It's depending on what hard is. I mean, as I said, I wasn't actually a great drinker. And here I am trying to plead the fifth, I suppose. But 
A few of them could drink, Salas could drink, and uh, Perra could drink, he just, they're out of my league. You played in that final we're talking about in 1980 against Collingwood. Yes. And Collingwood won that. Yes, they killed us. Purse Jones got the sack. Yes. Um, do you, did you, he's a good friend of yours, Purse. Did you, yes. Did you feel that you were partly responsible that, because Jones had taken the team to the second place yes. on the home and away ladder. Yeah. And loses his job in his first year. Yeah, I, look, it's, that would be something you'd have to ask the club. There's a bit more to it than that, I think. Um, because a lot of that didn't get out till later. I mean, I remember Perth coming. I mean, after that game, for example, I'd actually anchor was crook, broke my nose, and had my thumb cracked on the same day. And I mean, I'm at the Epworth with my leg in the air, arm in the air, and my nose broken. And Perth comes in to give me a spray. <laughs> and this is almost this is almost two weeks after after the final. And so he's gone. He's been sacked. But by there was then? nothing. There was nothing evident at that stage then. I think what happened was that, and there's no doubt in my mind that the power brokers of the club, and you know who they would have been, they that Parkham was free. So that we're talking about Collo and John Elliott. Yeah, yeah, and Lofsey. Yeah, and Lofsey. Yeah, yeah. Pa- Parkham was free. He's, he's a you know, probably once in a generation type coach. Mm-hmm. So why wouldn't you? So to say that with for Perth, I don't. I think that's a bit. Of, uh, it's not unfair because the other two boys didn't play. Yeah, that's, and, I, yeah. and I wasn't supposed to play. Yeah. So and my game wasn't that bad. It was yeah. You know, wasn't my game yeah, okay. wasn't that bad yeah. at all. So um, I probably you know, you got to remember for for that year I'd played every game that year. It's the only time in my career I played every game. And if you talk about needles today, I probably had a minimum of three a week, minimum of three oh. a week from two weeks prior to the first game to the last game. Is that a good idea? Shocking idea. Should never have happened. But I'm not winging and blueing about yeah. it. That was just the way it was. And, yeah. So the needles were to drain the fluid. Yeah, I had, and I had a bad killers. need. To yeah. drain, drain the fluid, then steroid it or painkiller it during the game, mm. then drain it during the game again. Yep. And then obviously strap it up for the week and then drain it again on Thursday so I could train and then do, go through the same routine again on the weekend. Wayne, you've got three boys who play footy at Port Melbourne. Yes. Currently. If that was the regime that they were under, what would you say? I wouldn't allow it to happen. I, I recognise that everything that I did or that had happened to me, and I'm not blaming anybody else, is that I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody else. Mm. And I think, hence in my book, I wrote about a dependence on painkillers and, and that stuff, which will probably come later. But I, I can tell you, it doesn't start, that doesn't happen overnight. It, it happens as a ritual. And, and I think it became too easy and too evident for people to say, well, OK, if he's got a crook ankle, crook knee, we can shoot this up and you go and play. Well, let's, let's stay on that topic. I was going to ask you yes. later about that. You did become drug dependent, didn't you? Um, yes, I, I, I was dependent on not so much the steroids or the painkillers. I, I had a major spot. Which is the steroids? No, no, no steroids or anything like that. No. I mean, nothing like that. But we ha- I had a, a serious back operation. I don't mm. know, this was 1982? 84, I was 84? actually captain. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd had the, the best start to a season I'd ever had. And I, I had this spinal operation, and what had happened was I caught a, a staff in, in the wound of the, of the operation. So after six days, I was almost ready to leave hospital. And on that, on that sixth night, I actually sweated up profusely, and uh, I'd obviously had, suffered a very nasty infection, a type of viral meningitis, so I could have, could have passed away. I went to intensive care. Instead of spending six days in hospital, I think I spent about 22. Mm. Visitors were mum and dad and David Parkin. And I was on 200 mils of pethidine every two hours, which is monstrous. Mm. But that was a necessity. And obviously plus drips. So I dare say a combination of a lot of the stuff that I had prior. But then to have that, it was a very hard thing to, to shake off. So every time I'd get a knee injury or an elbow injury, I'd say, oh, Doc, I, I wouldn't mind a shot mm. of that. So it was a dependence, not an addiction. But you did say in the book... You termed yourself a drug addict at the time. In, 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 yeah, well, it's probably, a, probably it's more a dependence. As you get older, you get to learn about these things because you don't become that type of person overnight. And it was an issue, not getting it every day. But that one with my spine, that, it was dangerous. And then I, I, you know, as I got older, I was probably more reliant on it after footy, not reliant on the painkillers, but more reliant after footy because at least with football I was fit and healthy. Yep, yep. So I had the muscle mass to support my back. And if you, you, know, you have to remember this. 85, 84 I was captain, 85 I played with that all year, and 86, 87, 88 were probably my three best years ever. So I came out of that well, but the dependence was still in the background. Was it? It was still in the yeah. background, and Did yet I, it was hidden because of form. 
Did it lead to anything else? Did you, any flirtation with any illicit substance? There's no illicit substance in my entire football career. Okay. Because you you've been the subject of lots of rumours over your career, haven't yes. you? Yeah, I've been many. Now, one of the things I want to quote you from your book, Wayne, the, years, the 1991 book, if there's an unusual way to get into hot water, I'm a fair chance to find it. Yeah, I, I suppose there's a, there's a, yeah, I suppose maybe people are talking about the people I used to hang around with or the, the, all the type of friends that I'd made mm. or the relationships I'd had. I, I used, to, used to gamble a bit in those days. I'd get myself in that. I'd get myself in a bit of money, money problems in those days. But, uh, you know, Gamble now, that, a bit mean what, on the horses? Yeah, just on the horses, yeah. yeah. That was almost, I mean, we were mates with Jimmy Buckley and <laughs> Sellers. And that. Yeah, he had nothing true. else. But yeah, yeah, not massive gamblers, but we were just gambling. You have to remember, we weren't, we weren't earning big money in those days. There's no big money at all. And we had a job to fulfil and I had a, quite a big family. Mm. So, and I, obviously there was, there was many highlighted issues. There was a, there was a highlighter, there was an affair that was highlighted, yep. which was put all over the papers, made the woman's day. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't much I didn't do that didn't make the some papers. form of headline. Yeah. But in the context of it all, if, if it all gets washed up at the moment, there's nothing on my name that says I was actually guilty of, of anything, do, of anything yeah. doing anything really crass, bad or nasty. I'm not a nasty person. Mm -hmm. I'm not okay. a crass type of person. You went to Richmond for a couple of yes. years uh, with yes. Terry Wallace's time? Yes. Two years as runner? Yes. What happened there? That seemed had, to end... I had a ball. You had I a had, ball, but... I had a ball, yeah. But it that. ended on a sour note, didn't it? Well, there, there, was, reports in, there was reports in the paper about something that had happened six or seven years ago or something, which was a load of crap, because now, once again, nothing ever came out of it. And I still don't, I'm not too sure what the story was about because it was well, what, something... What was the subject? Well, the subject was made up of, um, there's an Indian, you know, that there was some form of uh, drug use or, or some party where there was something, someone, someone had been picked up for stealing a computer, mm. and on this computer was a so-called image. I mean, I've never seen them. Okay. I've, I've never seen any of it. And, but that came out, but that wasn't the reason why I left Richmond. That, was, that came on after I'd left. As you know now, you can see me limping today. Yep. My feet were shot. Yep. I'd spoken to Plough and, uh, and the uh, football manager there at the time, uh, Paul Armstrong, that I, was, couldn't, I just couldn't, literally couldn't run. Mm. How much were you damaged by the fact that you and Kate, Kate Kendall, were at Wayne Carey's place when... Um, illicit substances were found. Yeah, I, I think that was fairly ordinary because we'd left <laughs> quite some time before and there was a myriad of other people that would have been there at the time. We were sort of quite flabbergasted by it because we'd actually uh, picked up my son, Clay, who was actually working at another area down the road. He was doing a function down in St Kilda. We dropped him off there and then we drove home. But for them so you weren't there when the police arrived? No. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> quite, quite, quite uh, once again, off the mark. Hmm. All these rumours, though, now, this is my view here, but I want your assessment of it. You should be in the Hall of Fame, in my view, in the, yes. in the Australian Football Hall of Fame. Do you think that these rumours and innuendos surrounding your lifestyle have negatively impacted on that? You have to ask the people that choose the, the, the people to induct into the Hall of Fame. Uh, if that was a prerequisite, then there'd be quite a few others that probably shouldn't <laughs> be there. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of innuendo and rumour, but I, th I would have thought that facts are everything. Yeah, but do you, do, is your own view? Yeah. I mean, oh, I've never thought about that part about the Hall of Fame. Only my mates do. You're they, not miffed that you're not in it? No, well, I'm in Carlton's Hall of Fame. Yeah, I've got four premierships of Carlton. I've got best and fairest of Carlton. I yep. feel I was always been a club man. Um, I suppose it'd be great to be in the Hall of Fame. It'd be fabulous. When we come back, Wayne, let's talk about the worst day of your life in Brisbane. Dom, a few on-field memories. One, I've got. I still shudder when I rem uh, at the memory of this when uh, you were playing at uh, Geelong. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Ablett is playing for the Cats. He collects you at roughly 100 miles an hour and you miss, I think, five or six games of footy. Uh, what, what happened was Luke O'Sullivan, who was, uh, our, uh, it was, it was one of his early games, and I led for a ball 30 metres running into our four line. It was when Gary was on the half-back flank. So the Rhinos kicked one 60 metres in the air for a 30 metre kick. So I'm running, <laughs> I'm running full ball like this. And you know, normally I, I don't pull out, occasionally you might. But I could see G. Ablett and I said, no, nah, I'm not stopping. And away we went and G. Ablett, you know, obviously he had, he had the hip and shoulder up and hit me right up the middle. I knew I was, when he hit me, I knew I was gone. 
I just knew everything inside me just wasn't in good shape, but I wouldn't <laughs> give him the satisfaction. But the funny thing was, if you could picture him just kneeling on one knee, watching me to see if I was going to fall. Believe me, I wanted to fall. The ball got thrown in from the boundary line. Thank God the th three quarter time siren went. And so I went off and what uh, Gaz had done, was he did, so, I swear, I reckon he sat, sat by look, just watching me to see if I was falling. What that, that, and he'd ruptured the lining of my spleen and also cracked my sternum. It was a big hit. Wow. You used to fight a, out of your division a bit. The 87 grand final, you took on Dipper. Dipper's taking the mark on the outer wing. Is out of bounds, evaded a couple of players. And I just happened to be sitting about 45 minutes after the he went to pork me. His evasive skills were that good, I told the, the uh, tribunal that I couldn't tackle him, so I had to reach out with my forearm. <laughs> and he did a 360 and hit the deck. And the funny thing about the tribunal was I was a bit lucky because Jack Gaffney was his last sitting on the tribunal. He was a pram boy. Fitzroy he boy. was so too, yeah. I got two. First four seasons at Carlton, the Blues play 78 games. Yes. You win 61 of them including three grand finals. No wonder you were pretty happy with yourself. Yeah, well, I suppose you've got to be, I suppose, at times like that. You ask, ask the Brisbane boys today, it'd be the same yeah. Angela Long boys. But it was an arrogance, but I mean, surely people at the, at the top end, you can be as committed, it doesn't mean you're not committed, but there was a bit of a swagger around town. But also you have to remember, different world too. We lived in a working man's world. We had to go to work each day. The mm. people that we were surrounded by people every day of the week. Today the boys are in a bubble, they don't get that opportunity. Mm. Um, then we'd go to training, be with our mates, probably on the odd Monday night, have a couple of beers. The odd talk. Monday night? Yeah, the odd Monday night. <laughs> what about the odd Monday, Monday night? Tuesday, Wednesday? <laughs> Not so, well, yeah, after a while that, that had stopped a little bit, but it was good. We, we would talk about you know, the games we were playing and who we were going to play. And it was, it, there was a bit of bravado about us, but also yeah, a bit of arrogance. People saw it as arrogance, people mm. didn't like us. You had a swagger, didn't you? Actually, my four-year-old walks the same way. It's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> when you see it in someone else. <laughs> uh, mate, it's, 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 if you watched him, if he was here right now, he could do it for you. It's, you say, Darcy, well done, and all of a sudden, he starts to wobble around like a duck. Now, Darcy's your, your child with Kate, Kate Kendall. Kate, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, the only one with Kate, and you yes. had um, five, five before that yes. with your first wife, Debbie. Yes. Yeah. You lost one. Yes. I remember writing the story, Wayne, about you losing your, yes. your boy. In a, uh, on a football field in Queensland. Yep. I mean, it was harrowing, as it always would be in that situation, but you cradled him, didn't you, when he had an asthma uh, attack? It was horrific, yes. He, they were playing in the, um, not the nationals, the state titles. Mm -hmm. Obviously the state titles, so the kids, under 12s. Yep. And they were playing at Sherwood. And all of us, it was a weird day, because the, the, the winters in Brisbane are beautiful. But this Brisbane morning happened to be just freezing cold, and the barometric, barometric pressure had dropped enormously. And he just... Uh, we're talking about Matt, Yeah, right? we're talking yeah. about Matt. One and of your he, twins? Yeah, twins, yes. And, he, and Tom, they were both playing on the, on the same ground at the same time mm. for the same team. And You my, were there? Yes, I was there. My wife was a, was a school teacher. She was part of it. Up there, it's all the school teachers, so she was a part of it. And uh, unfortunately, he was best player on the ground a quarter time, so the last thing you would have thought in the world was, is anything wrong? He mm. went into the huddle and went into a sort of a hyperventilation. And... Uh, the St John's people had just gone for their break, which they were welcome to do, and uh, there was you know, no doctor there, which is nobody's fault really, and uh, they couldn't revive him, and I had to grab him and uh, <clears throat> yeah, try our best, and uh, we actually took him from the middle of the ground, from the huddle to the bench, rely on the ground, and a friend of ours uh, tried to revive him until the paramedics got there. The paramedics got there, and they were amazing. They, they did resuscitate him, but it was a long time. It was a long time getting him to resuscitate. They were going to fly him back into, into the hospital, but they couldn't do that. They couldn't get the chopper there in time, so they took him in the ambulance. Uh, but at the same time, his brother Tom actually collapsed while Matt was you know, uh, down. So they were able to revive Tom quite quickly because they were there in time. Matt passed, that was on June 13. Matt passed away on, late on the 15th of June, which is only a couple of weeks ago where we had his anniversary, 14 years. Wow. He was in your arms, wasn't he? Yes. We, we, was it mouth to mouth and cardiac no, massage? I, no, I wasn't capable. I was more in sh shock. Mm. And he just said, Dad, I can't breathe. And, uh, and that's, that's uh, horrific. And we had a friend of ours that had uh, the expertise in that. And uh, he tried his best. He did a wonderful job uh, but when the paramedics got there. It was quite serious. It was, it was a, quite a serious attack. And uh, when they took him to the, 
to the emergency, that was very serious. Something that only probably a professional could have revived. It was a very, it was just a, like a lightning bolt from hell wow. that you wouldn't expect. I'm sure you've been haunted by this thought, but had there been, had the paramedics been there or a doctor been there, would it have, would it have made a difference? Oh, look, I'm, that's a hypothetical, but I, I'm sure it would have because that's, that's what they do. They're professionals. Um, to have something like this happen, I, I don't, I mean, to blame someone, it's not about blaming, mm. could they have, oh, I would say yes, if, you know, if, if a doctor had been there, maybe, that, that may be the case, but uh, that's a maybe. Did you have to turn life support off? Uh, they wanted to, uh, given that there's a law up there that you have to have, wait 24 hours, and I, I asked them to take that because well, the drugs they were administering were only there to keep his body in a state of normality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, OK, but then unfortunately that didn't work. So things started to become abnormal physically, which I, f I actually forced the issue to the registrar to to uh, pull the pull the plugs. It was the registrar's sons actually played wow. against my boys. I, I, mean, I can't imagine the impact on, on your life. Did you, did you lose direction and... Yes, and, yeah. of course I lost direction. I lost direction, but there's still other, there's other children in my, mm. in my life um, who wouldn't. You were married at the time. Yes. Did that put any strain on the marriage? Which well, the marriage dissolved ultimately, didn't it? Yeah, it ultimately dissolved, and it wasn't long after that, but I, I would suggest that would have put some strain on it, for sure and certain. I mean, I think a mother... A mother's child is that they obviously completely different than than us as being males, but the loss was bitter and the loss was sad, mm. and it was never ending. It's, mm. it's a loss; it doesn't come back. So all you can do is uh, try to be positive and uh, better and and good at what you do with your children moving forward. And uh, that's about it. But it's, yeah, it was, it was probably a, a, yeah, probably one of those things that would have been a great divide, I suppose, between us, a stake in the heart, I suppose, of both, but we went our own, our own ways, mm. yeah, not long after that. Dominator, it's been a, a sensational career. Your life's had its ups and downs. Thanks for sharing the story with us. It's been good. I had a good career. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Thank you. This has been a Fox Footy production for Fox Sports.